everybody. Welcome to the Still to be Determined podcast. This is the podcast that follows up on topics from the YouTube channel Undecided with Matt Farrell. I'm not Matt Farrell. I'm Sean. I'm his older brother. I'll be asking him the questions. Matt will be giving the answers. Matt, say hi. Hi. Before we get into this week's episode, just some reminders of ways you can support the podcast. You can, of course, keep doing what you're doing right now, listening or watching us on YouTube. You can also like and subscribe and share with your friends. You can also go to stilltbd.fm. There's a link there that will allow you to throw some pennies at us. I know it sounds like it will hurt, but we like having pennies thrown at us. <laughs> Today we're going to be talking about, well, getting a lot of hot air out of the way, I guess is one way of putting it. <laughs> Ironic. I, I like what you did there. Yeah. Yeah. But before we get into that, some talking about our last episode which of course was about algae as a resource for plastic production. Armando Moraglia, and I hope I haven't mangled your name too badly, Armando, had this to say, I think, as you say, many of the problems we are trying to solve are caused by us. Quite obviously, what happens to me with all the things I try to fix at home. What is amazing is the super ideas that come out of these situations. But I am always suspicious about what problems these solutions will cause later on. And <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. That's a very good pointing out of <laughs> yeah. the dominoes that fall once we start trying to solve the problems that we've already created ends up going in directions we can't anticipate or should anticipate, but don't. And yes. we're looking at you, Australia, yes. with your plans to introduce rabbits into an environment where they didn't exist. And then once they went out of control, introducing predators that didn't exist in that environment. And then that cycle causes problems for literally decades. Yeah. You can see that in a, like wind power. It's like they built turbines too close to neighborhoods. And I don't know if you've ever seen videos of it. It looks horrific mm -hmm. of as the sun is setting in certain like regions, the sun then casts a shadow off the turbine oh, right no. into somebody's living room window. And it's just like this, whoosh, whoosh, just oh, like no. shade. It, it's, it's that kind of stuff is like poor planning. Yeah. It's like totally avoidable, but somebody was not thinking ahead about what, what's the shadow going to be like? And are we plan are we building these too close to somebody's residence? That's going to cause a problem. It's like, it's just little things that we kind of overlook. What has been done in, in areas like that? Have there been cases of, uh, municipalities putting something in place and then having to take it down. Has that ever happened? I've, I've never heard of that. There might be cases of that, but, but given how much money it takes to put those things in, I highly doubt. I think it's, yeah, I think it's down. probably more likely that those municipalities end up paying yeah. communities for a loss of the value of their property or those property owners are just stuck, which is, yeah. There's a long history of that happening too, where communities do yes. things that hurt individuals and then the individuals are just stuck, which of course is a nightmare scenario that nobody wants to be stuck in. There was also this from Roger Starkey. Roger, good to hear from you again. Roger writes, okay, I'm going all in and saying that rather than being algae you in your dreams, this should be a planktonic <laughs> relationship. I'll get my point. <laughs> well done, Roger. <laughs> It was a long you, walk Roger, to get there, but once he arrived, it was worth the trip. It was worth it. Yeah. Totally worth that trip. So for today's episode, we're going to talk about Matt's most recent episode, which was space powered cooling, maybe the future of energy. And this is from September 28th, 2021. And Matt, you're going to have to bear with me as I try to wrap my head <laughs> This <laughs> seems like magic. Around something <laughs> that is exponentially larger than my head. Yes. The space window. The, <laughs> yes. The space <laughs> window. This yes. has to do, if I understand, I'm going to try and just throw out in very rough layman's terms what I think is happening. Mm -hmm. Aliens. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Let me start it over. <laughs> I'm not saying it's aliens. <laughs> But, it could but it's be. aliens. Yes. <laughs> there are wavelengths of energy. Yes. That are more easily emitted out of the Earth's atmosphere. Correct. It's a very it's eight to thirteen micrometer wavelengths that can just they escape the atmosphere. Right. This is separate from 
the earth shedding of atmosphere molecules. This is not connected to that in any way. This is basically infrared heat, okay. a very specific wavelength right. that can escape the atmosphere. The rest kind of keeps bouncing around inside the atmosphere. It gets stuck okay. in here with us. So it's almost like there's a giant uh, filter around the planet that allows certain types of radiation out. And if we can get some of our excess radiation into that wavelength, it will go. Correct. Yep. All right. See, it's this kind of baby step thinking <laughs> yep. that gets Sean to actually be able to, to understand what is happening here. Because I watched the video and I was like, this is fascinating. I have no idea what is happening. <laughs> that was me when I first read about this. I was like, hey, what? what huh? <laughs> I had to read it again. And I had to go look up videos. And I watched the guy who created the company we talk about in the video. I watched mm -hmm. some TED Talks with him and I had to watch it again and again. I'm like, okay. I, th I think I understand what he's talking about. No, I don't understand what he's talking about. I have to go back and watch yeah. it again. <laughs> yeah. It took me a yeah. while, but I got there. Yeah. And to be honest, that's, that sadly will hold the progress of this technology back, won't it? I Trying to get a room full of people to understand this could be very, very difficult. And with investors who are like, well, I want to be able to hold this in my hand. The difference, I think, is they have a panel and it's like they can say, it's going to save this much money if you use this with your, your refrigerators, or it's going to save you this much money if you use this with your air conditioning. It's like, that's going to be like, okay, I don't need to understand the whole wavelength space window thing. Just save me the money. It's like, I think that's not going to hold it back if they can right. prove out that the value is there because money makes the world go around. <laughs> right. It comes back to And that. somebody who's going to invest in this would likely have their own scientific advisors who yeah. they would turn to and be like, so should I give this guy my money? But on a surface level says, yes, I think it makes sense. Yeah. And then, on a surface level, though, it sounds like hokum. It sounds like he's making it up. Like there's this yeah. magical space window that we can shoot yeah. heat out of. Yeah. It's like, okay, here's your snake Do oil. Do you have <laughs> too much heat? Do you want to get rid of it? But you don't know how. How Try much would you window. pay? Yeah. How much would you pay to make your heat go to space? Yeah. <laughs> Nine ninety <Yeah>. nine. <laughs> Did you just knock over a bottle of heat all over your counter? Space window will take care of it. <laughs> and and then Sean has to take a nap. Yes. Yep. Yeah. One of the things that stands out right now is you are coming across technology which does sound like hokum. Mm -hmm. You're, you're, and you're, but you're, you're butting your head directly into that. The previous episode that we talked about, we, we had a similar discussion, which was how do you understand what path to take? And I'm wondering what signs the, basically the people who would utilize this, how do they begin to understand whether or not this is something that would work for them? You mentioned there's some studies being done that basically one of the studies was like, yeah, you've got this paint that can do this thing, but it's far too expensive to make it worthwhile. Mm -hmm. What agencies, what places are looking at all of that to determine those paths? Mm -hmm. Are there government agencies evaluating whether or not this is something that should be used in large scale construction or is it literally down to individuals involved in construction or transportation or what have you determining on a case by case basis does something like this does this paint work for us does this material work for us is this most of the are time we just letting is this literally just the market taking care of itself it's a little bit of the market but in this specific case a lot of it is university research there's a lot of universities doing research into this kind of thing. Um, so sometimes universities partner with private companies to do the research around these things. They get patents and then that company owns those patents and can make the product. Um, sometimes some of the research in this was like the, the guy who created sky cool. It's like, it's university research that sprang into a private company that is then trying to address a market need. Um, so like, but the paint, thing that I brought up that was just university research just to, uh, evaluating like what can we do with white paints <laughs> so it's it's it's, right. it's 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 interesting because it's like there's a blend most of the time of the things I talk about between uh private industry and universities doing tandem research on things uh to right. figure this stuff out I couldn't help but wonder about the paint too and this sounds like a joke 
when you mm-hmm. say it, but it is not a joke. Would that paint be hard to look at? Would it be? It'd be bright. <laughs> But it, it would, would be not very be hard bright. And it seems to me like putting it on a vehicle, driving down the road, driving down the highway, that could have implications if it's so if it's so reflective of all the wavelengths that it effectively could stand out as a problem for oncoming traffic, even. It it depends. This is where it gets tricky again, because it's like, what are you trying to reflect? And you can create paints that reflect those specific wavelengths, but don't reflect that are invisible to the human eye. Correct. So it's like it's okay. reflecting certain things, but not the visible wavelengths aren't like it's not going to be like a blinding thing. Coming at you. Right. It's not going to be a you, mirror car coming. Correct. The corner. Right. right. Yeah. It's, it's your brain. Again, I think, I think, steps. I think it's your brain leaking out your ear a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so there were some interesting comments um, with people utilizing. It feels like a lot of these comments are about adjacent technologies or parallel technologies, but not necessarily this tech itself. Mm-hmm. But I think that they do bear some, they do start conversation in the in the right vein. So I wanted to share these thoughts. Like this one from Michael Matthews who write, simple reflectivity can produce amazing results. I bought an older house in Northern California, which had a nearly flat tar and gravel roof. Just a personal aside, it is astounding to me that we built things like that mm-hmm. in these ways as you know to, to at a certain point a hundred years ago you build what you can build that's understandable yes. but a lot of these houses 1960s construction 1970s construction that utilized this type of roof they were just ignoring the obvious it feels like so yeah. it's a flat tar and gravel roof and the house he writes was an absolute oven in the hot months. We air conditioned it, all was fine. Then a year later, had the roof replaced with a white polymer and the type used of the type used on commercial buildings. And the location and design makes it invisible to the neighbors. The air conditioner never ran again. That <laughs> seems like such a yeah. simple solution for a homeowner to drastically reduce. That's not solar panels. That's not insulation. That it's literally just reflecting light from a black surface via a white surface. As simple as that, and that's yes. remarkable to me. Yeah, it's just a simple white paint. Doesn't need to be fancy. Just a simple white paint is a step in the right direction. Right. Which is one of the things I brought up later in the video, which was: Is this stuff even better than white paint? Because it's like, okay, it's this fancy technology that costs more money. Well, why couldn't I just go to Lowe's and pick up a white right. paint and do it? And it's like. There are definite benefits for this, the higher end paints that are specifically designed for this or these panels that are designed for this. They do have an edge. Or in this case with Michael, who is talking about a tar and gravel roof, I wonder if even changing the color of the gravel alone could have been. It would have helped. Helpful. Yeah. So it's, it's one of those balancing the price point with what you're trying to get to. Bingo. It's not an all or nothing. It's not like, well, if I can't put in solar panels, I shouldn't even try. Bingo. Yes. Maybe solar panels are out of my reach, but what could I do? There's got, there's got to be something. And I wonder, other than people like you creating videos like this, are there people who help with those resources? Do you know, are you aware of, of contractors who might have this kind of expertise to come into a homeowner's place and say, Oh, you can't put in solar panels, but what about these other options that might be available to you? There Do you are, see that growing? It's growing, but they're they're yeah. far and few between. It's if you're looking at builders or architects that specialize in passive homes, net zero homes, um, lead certification for uh, big office buildings, those kind of people who specialize in that do exactly this. It's like they're looking at every possible angle to really get your biggest bang for your buck to make the most energy efficient building they can possibly give you right. given your budget. Where probably I'd say 80 to 90% of the, the market of builders don't know half this stuff. And so right. it's like, you're kind of going blind and it's like, you just made the comment of, I can't believe we were building houses with tar and gravel in the sixties and seventies. It's like, if it works, it works. And why change it? Right. That's, that's a lot of the building industry, sadly. And so this right. cutting edge stuff is still trickling down and over time we'll get there, but it's still trickling down. Right. And it's going to take these companies that are trying to push these products, reaching out to the contractors, providing them with the education around the use of their product and how to do it. In the opposite direction, you have the architects 
who you described as having like the lead certification thinking but a lot of homeowners are going to be are going to shy away from spending that kind of yes. money and so you end up with it's a waiting game or individual research and even if it's individual research you might not find an easy path to actually utilizing some of this stuff in your right. area well so. the, the other thing is like you can look at different areas of the world like europe is like 10 steps ahead of the united states on this kind of stuff it's par for the course for building very energy efficient homes over there and triple plane windows and there's these european style windows that you can get that are incredibly efficient and those are just really starting to slowly catch on here in the united states so it's like we're lagging behind and you can kind of look to europe and see where we're going to end up the path mm -hmm. that we're going down but um it's it's definitely possible but your point is spot on of like for me i'm building a house that's going to be incredibly energy efficient it costs more than an average house Right. And so there's going to be a challenge. There could be challenges with certain banks because when they go to appraise what you want to build, they're going, oh, an average house cost of this costs this much. Why are you paying, you know, a hundred thousand more? doesn't make sense. We're right. not going to give you that money. So there's, there's an education, not even in just the building. There's education throughout the other industries that are tangential. Right. The finance industry. Yes. That, yeah. Yeah. Are you finding yourself in a place where you are going to have to put together an information packet about what is being done in mm -hmm. building your home when you go looking for yes. mortgages, like yes. an attachment with a side letter saying like, please note, here are all the very smart things we're doing, which is why this costs a hundred thousand more. Yeah. The, the bank that we're dealing with, it's like the guy that we've been dealing with, he seems to get it. But when we send over the final plans, we're going to be sending over basically a write up of why the extra cost for certain things and what it's going to look like over the next 10, 20, 30 years and why it's you need to evaluate it in a different standard than a typical right. three bedroom house or something like that. So yes, again, that's more leg work than some people are going to feel <laughs> comfortable doing. <So>. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's interesting because you're basically laying out the idea that you are not in the elite earthship vanguard of removing yourself from all of these things and really pioneering this, but you're a few steps back from that where industries are incorporating some of this thinking and these things are now commercially available for you but you're still feeling that resistance that cultural societal mm -hmm. resistance in the form of a bank simply saying oh this has nothing to do with judging you but we punched the numbers into our computer and it came up with a thumbs down exactly and it's not about judging you or your goals. It's just that we are looking at things as pluses and minuses in an equation and you came up negative. Yeah. Their equation and is outdated. It's going to take some time for yeah. the indus that industry to say, oh, we need to change our algorithm to incorporate mm -hmm. some of this smart forward thinking. Yeah. There was this comment from Dave Dugdale. He said, the video was interesting and he asked the question so i put solar panels on the south side of my roof and sky cool panels on the north side of the roof is it really that simple or is this more of a or is it more like a later comment which is from alexander poplowski who said i think solar panels combined with heat pumps using soil based heat exchangers would be more efficient it would be used for cooling in the summer and heating in the winter and you've had videos about that before mm -hmm. we've talked about that exact thing this really does start to sound like it's a mix and match of yes a little bit from column a a little bit from column b could sky cool panels be something that would be on part of your roof and solar panels on the other part or, absolutely 100 percent. Like and there, and that's already, also not to say you couldn't incorporate also the heat pumps and correct. soil cooling correct like there's also um uh solar thermal panels which are meant to absorb the heat from the sun and it's used to help uh give you hot water and things inside your house so it's like there's already panels that do that kind of thing so it's like you could theoretically have panels that are capturing the sun's heat for helping to heat water you could have panels that are helping to generate electricity and then you could have some more panels on the other end of your roof which help to reduce your cooling costs for like your refrigerators and your ac and things like that so it's like you could have two or three kinds of panels on your roof 
that really kind of tick the box for different things and what different goals you're trying to do. It all depends on where you live and what your goals are. But yeah, you could have several types of panels on your roof. Right. Yeah. And then if you dig too deep, you realize you've got nothing but panels. Yes. <laughs> I don't have any walls. What happened? <laughs> I'm living in a giant panel. <laughs> I'm, I'm underneath panels. There was this comment from someone's potato. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Which usernames always stand out as like, there's some very interesting computers out there punching out random words that just somebody's like, well, my name was taken on YouTube, so I'm going to go with someone's potato. <laughs> but potato writes, would be nice to hear about the maintenance. Anything mm -hmm. which relies on being reflective will suffer when it gets dirty. How often do these need to be cleaned? How much is the reflectiveness harmed by surface damage that you get just from existing? And You've had things in previous videos talking about damage to solar panels and how they're tested and surviving things like hail and windstorms that kick up small rocks and sand and, and that kind of abrasive damage over time. Is there any information you have about similar things with this type of technology? The only things I found were it, it kind of equated it to a solar panel for durability. That's really all I found. And I would imagine that it would hold up just as well as a solar panel. And depending on where you live, you might have to clean it off if it gets covered with lots of dust. Other areas of the world, you wouldn't have to worry about that as much because you'd have rain kind of keeping it clean. So it really depends on where you are. But from everything I found, it's you can equate it very much to a solar panel. There was also this from Chris Tony. Two years ago, while replacing shingles, we also replaced our roof deck boards with radiant bearer roof decking we noticed a significant reduction in attic temperatures, which would run 97 degrees Fahrenheit at noon in July. And our HVAC system runs significantly less. That's on the Gulf Coast. Passive radiant barrier should be required in all new home construction. And I highly recommend it to anyone looking to redo their own roof. I think this is one of those comments of somebody's experience really demonstrating the value of something, but that the industry just doesn't have those yep. kinds of requirements because the burden of usage is continuing to fall on the consumer. Yes. So because nobody is going to fault you for using as much electricity as you want to, as long as you're paying that bill, nobody really cares what you're using it for. And if you're having to run an air conditioner 24 hours a day, just to keep a, a 97 degree Fahrenheit attic, is that heat is going to be bleeding through into the rest of the house and your entire home is going to be suffering because of that. But as long as you're paying electric bills on time, nobody cares how much you're using that. that and that's, that's part of the <laughs> equation here is that nobody like s collectively, nobody is saying, okay, where is that electricity going and where can we help limit it? And things like energy star yep. for air conditioners is great. That's terrific. But that's not impacting this issue, which Yet. is the structure itself is not built in an energy efficient way. So they, in the US, they recently rolled out the energy star ratings for homes. So that actually is starting. And so like when you start to, the more we common this becomes, the better we'll, we'll see it. Because like now when you go into a store and you're buying a refrigerator, you see the energy star ratings on every refrigerator. And so you, right. and it tells you what the average costs to run it at per year is houses are starting to do that same exact thing and like here in massachusetts there's incentives like if your house meets a certain energy star rating you get a rebate and so it's like you're going to start seeing that more and more and it's going to make consumers a little wiser of like what's the energy star rating of this house we want to get oh wow that's an awful rating but the one over here has a lower rating we're going to go for that one because it's going to be cheaper to run. right so as but wouldn't that be for new construction only yeah it's really only for new construction and that's, yeah, that's, a, that's the weakness there. Yep. Places like where I live, I live in, in, you know, the middle of New York city and they're building new buildings, but the vast amount of housing is very old construction. And I couldn't tell you what the energy efficiency of the building I live in is, mm -hmm. but it can't be good. It's a building that was built in 1910, I believe. So, you know, we're lucky that it's just one brick thick. So all of this, it's, I think the big takeaway for me is it's great that this path now is being uh, taken and, mm -hmm. and being looked at, 
I'm interested to see in 10, 15 years where this technology is ending up. And if we're seeing it used in car paint on the road, the idea that a car could be cooler on the inside simply by changing the color of the paint. Yes. The type of paint itself yep. uh, is astounding. And where this where this could lead toward more efficiencies, better efficiencies. And I'm curious from our listeners, do you currently live in a place that has the kinds of things that Matt talked about with Europe being ahead of the curve. Do any of our listeners have experience with being closer to the Vanguard as we've talked about? And if you are, what have you seen? What are the different types of incorporation of these newer techs into building and home ownership and wherever else you're seeing it? Let us know. We'd love to hear about that. You can find the contact information in the podcast description. And if you're on YouTube, of course, you can just scroll right down to the comment section. While you're doing all that, please do remember to subscribe. You can also like this recording, share it with your friends. We have ways to directly support the podcast. You can go to visit stilltbd.fm and you'll see the support the podcast link there. And there's a tiny cookie jar and it takes tiny pennies. And we appreciate whatever kind of support you're able to give. Whatever kind of support you're able to give, we greatly appreciate it. We appreciate your spending your time with us. We know how precious that can be. Please be sure to give a review, a rating, and share with your friends. All of that really does help the podcast. The podcast helps the channel. The channel helps Matthew. And then Matthew covers me in panels. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening, everybody. We'll talk to you next time.